Okay, so let's start cardiovascular anatomy. So you all have all done the, or most of you, hopefully you have done the extra credit quiz. You have some idea, at least you've come read. Okay, so you know some idea. So let's look first at the position of the heart. So when you're looking at the position of the heart, this is a transverse section which is taken through the thorax up here. The two lungs on either side surrounded by, by, by their individual pleural cavities. <clears throat> and this central area which lies between the vertebral column at the back and the sternum in front and the two pleural cavities on either side, this central area is called the mediastinum. And the heart lies in this mediastinal area, okay? So it's lying in this mediastinum. So you can see it's got the two lungs with their pleural cavities on either side. And then this is a picture which is a coronal section. So here you can see the two lungs, the parietal pleura, which we'll see later, will be on the outside. The visceral pleura will surround it. Here is the heart. And the heart is covered by a thick bag. The heart is, an, of course, a very important organ. So you need to protect it as much as possible. Uh, when you did ANP1, you talked about body cavities. And that might kind of, to refresh your memory, remember we had something called a ventral body cavity, which was divided into thoracic and abdominal pelvic. Okay, so you can see that the heart's lying in the thoracic cavity. And then you also had something called serous cavities, which were like little thin little balloons uh, flu with fluid inside, and they surrounded these organs. And the part of that serous cavity which covered the surface of the organ we call the visceral layer, and the part which covered the peripheral area we call the parietal layer, okay? In the case of the heart, there, we do have that serous bag but outside of the serous bag, we have another very thick fibrous tissue bag, which is called the fibrous pericardium. So this is outside of that serous bag, which we will look at. This is called fibrous pericardium, very, very thick. Imagine like a brown paper bag. It's unyielding. It doesn't allow any stretch or anything, okay? And then we'll see when we open up this fibrous pericardium what we are going to be looking at. So here, now let's look at the various layers of the heart. So first, let's look at a transfer section of the heart, and, um, and then we can see how we will place it here. So if we go from outside to inside, so if I take a cut section through the whole heart, this is the outermost layer, and this is the innermost layer. So on the outermost layer, we have this fibrous pericardium, which I just showed you in that previous diagram. And then next to the fibrous pericardium, we have what is called the serous pericardium. The serous pericardium has two layers, a parietal and a visceral layer. So the parietal layer is on the outside. Then there is the pericardial cavity here. And then this here is the visceral layer. So if I was to draw this for you, so imagine this bag like this. This is called the serous pericardium. This was in the beginning when the heart was developing. And here's the heart, which is beginning to push into this bag. So when it pushes into the bag, you can see the bag will become like this, right? This here is the pericardial cavity. At this point, there is no parietal or visceral layers, just one continuous layer. When the heart begins to push inside, you can see that one layer becomes very close to the heart. It becomes intimately attached to the surface of the heart. And then the other layer, which is this one, is on the outside. So it kind of artificially gets divided into two layers, OK? This layer, which is in relation to the heart, is called the visceral layer because it's in relation to an organ, also known as a viscous. And this layer, which is on the outside, is called the parietal layer. And again, between the two is the pericardial cavity. Do you see that? OK? So that's why here is the fibrous pericardium. Next to it is the parietal pericardium. So if I was to show you the fibrous pericardium in this picture, so here is where I would draw the fibrous pericardium, okay, which would be the outermost layer. And then can you see that the parietal pericardium is lining the inside of the fibrous pericardium? Can you see that? Then is the pericardial cavity. Then is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. And then we would have the layers of the heart itself. So same thing here, fibrous pericardium, parietal layer of the serous pericardium, pericardial cavity here, then this is the visceral layer, 
and look at the visceral layer attached intimately to the surface of the heart. In fact, the visceral layer form, forms the outer layer of the ha uh, heart, which is known as the epicardium. So this epicardium is nothing but visceral pericardium. This epicardium is nothing but visceral pericardium, okay? So the epicardium or visceral layer forms the outermost layer of the heart itself. The middle layer is called is made up of cardiac muscle, so it's called myocardium, myo going for muscle. And then the innermost layer of the heart is endocardium. So these are the layers of the heart. These are the coverings of the heart. So to review, the coverings are fibrous pericardium, which is a thick layer. And you can see it here, this outer gray part is the fibrous pericardium. Then inside the peri fibrous pericardium is this bag called serous pericardium, which gets divided into parietal and visceral layers. Parietal lines, you can see the inside of the fibrous pericardium, then gets reflected and becomes the outer surface of the heart, where it's called the visceral layer, but is also known as epicardium. <laughs> In between the parietal and visceral layers of serous pericardium, that's where the pericardial cavity is. So can you see that the heart is surrounded by the pericardial cavity? It's not lying inside this pericardial cavity. Can you see that? And then here are the three layers of the heart. The outermost is, you can call it visceral layer or epicardium, because when we talk of the layers, we call it epicardium. The middle layer is myocardium, and the innermost layer is endocardium, which is the lining of the heart, and that becomes continuous with the blood vessels that emerge from the heart or enter the heart, okay? Have you all followed this? Mm -hmm. So let's say you got a question like this. Where do you think the blood is going to be? James is stabbed. <laughs> this actually was a question which was in your notes also. So, you know, sometimes I don't repeat them, so please do make sure that you kind of look at these questions. Very good, yes, it's between the parietal and visceral layers of serous pericardium. Remember, that's where the pericardial cavity is. It's not between the parietal and the fibrous pericardium and not between the epicardium and endocardium. So let's go back here to look at this. This is the pericardial cavity. Can you see this one? This is the pericardial cavity. Note, notice where it is. It's between the parietal and visceral layers. So the bleeding occurs here. It does not occur between the visceral layer and the endocardium. That bleeding would be here. It does not occur between the parietal and the fibrous. That means you're going to lift off the fibrous and cause a balloon like this to happen. It doesn't occur there, okay? Because this parietal layer and fibrous pericardium are firmly adherent, as you can see from this picture, okay? And that's why any bleeding, can you understand, if there was bleeding in the pericardial cavity, it would affect the functioning of the heart. Because if this was filled with blood, what would happen? The heart will not be able to expand, isn't it? It won't be able to fill with blood, and it can't do its job. So it becomes actually a cardiac emergency. Now here, let's look at the borders and surfaces of the heart. When you look at the heart, imagine the heart is, you're looking first at the heart from the side. So this is a side view of the heart. You're looking at it from the side, and it's kind of like a little triangular prism or pyramid. And if I was to show it to you here in class, it would be like this. Imagine you're looking at the heart from the side this way. Can you see? This is the front or the anterior surface. This is the inferior surface, and this is the posterior surface. Do you understand as you're looking at it? So here, too, if you look at the heart from the side, this is facing the front would be the anterior surface. This part here would be posterior surface. This part here is the inferior part, so it's called the inferior surface, or also known as diaphragmatic surface because the heart rests on the diaphragm, okay? So here, let's look first at the borders and surfaces of the heart. 
So when we draw the heart, the heart is, you know, doesn't look anything like this. Mm -hmm. This is what we normally draw it as. The heart actually looks somewhat like this. If you were to draw it, it is somewhat like this. So if I was to draw it, okay, I think I should change my color. So you can see that it's somewhat like this, okay? So this is the right side, this is the left side, this is inferior and this is superior, okay? Now if I was to show this to you, we use, so this would be the right border of the heart, this would be the inferior border of the heart, this would be the left border of the heart, and that there would be the superior border of the heart, okay? But whenever we talk about these borders, we always talk about what chambers form the borders. So how do we decide like, which chamber is which part? So between the, one thing that you notice from here, the atria, and again, if I was to draw the heart quickly like this, a primitive heart, so there, you know, we have four chambers, right? The atria lie on top, the ventricles lie below, and it, this is a very strategic position because it allows the atria to pour the blood by gravity into the ventricles. Atrial walls are rather thin. They can't contract as efficiently as ventricular walls. The ventricles are below. They receive the blood, and then when they receive the blood, they push it out by means of arteries to wherever they have to go. But how do we decide which is the atrium, which is the ventricle? So you need to kind of have some sort of a groove or something which separates the two, okay? So between the atria and the ventricle, there is a groove present which is called the atrioventricular sulcus. The word sulcus means groove. Sulcus means groove. Atrioventricular, yeah. And everything in anatomy, if you really think about it, it's quite logical. Because it's between atria and ventricles, you call it atrioventricular. Then there is a sulcus which is present between the two ventricles, so it's called interventricular. Interventricular sulcus, between two ventricles. Okay? So let's look at this first one, which is the atrioventricular sulcus. This atrioventricular sulcus is also called the coronary sulcus because we will see that it goes around the heart like this, separating the atria above from the ventricles below. And lying in this coronary sulcus are blood vessels. And these blood vessels give off branches which come down like this. So this kind of looks like an inverted crown. If I was to draw a crown, crown is like that, right? Not a very good crown, but it's okay. We turn it down this way, so it looks like an inverted crown. The word corona means crown. Okay, so since it looks like a crown, which has just been turned around, that's why it's also called, the atrioventricular is also called the coronary sulcus. So let's trace this coronary sulcus. So here we are looking at this, in this picture, we are looking at this part of the heart, which is the anterior or also known as the sternocostal surface, because you know your heart is related to the sternum and the costal cartilages, right? So this part is called the anterior or also the sternocostal surface. So all of this area is the anterior or sternocostal surface. So we're looking at this part of the heart. Here, what I have done is that instead of just looking at the posterior part of the heart, I've kind of rotated the heart a little bit. So I've kind of rotated the heart a little bit like that. So I'm looking at both posterior and inferior surface, okay? So I'm kind of looking at both posterior and inferior. So I'm looking at both this and this. So th therefore, this is also called the postero-inferior surface, okay? So if I said the heart was like this, first I'm looking at this, then I've turned it around like that, and I'm looking at the postero-inferior surface. So here is, I'm going to trace the coronary sulcus. So just follow my um, cursor. You don't need to write this down. So we said it goes between the atria and the ventricles. So here's the coronary sulcus traveling like this. It comes around. It goes to the back. And then we can kind of trace this coronary sulcus going to the back and coming back around like that. We'll see it more in other 
pictures, but for now, just follow this. So it'll go around, it'll go to the back, we can't see it in this, and then it'll come back up here. So this is the coronary sulcus, dividing the atria above from the ventricles below. So here is the posterior part of this coronary sulcus like this. Then we have the interventricular sul sulci, because there are two of them. They're actu actually one, but it's got a part in the front and a part at the back, or part anterior and part posterior. So we call it the anterior interventricular sulcus and the posterior interventricular sulcus. It's really one, but just continuous from front to back. So here, can you see this kind of a line? So this is between the two ventricles. So you can see this. This is the anterior interventricular sulcus. It hooks around. And then we see it at the back up here, where it is the posterior interventricular sulcus, OK? So anterior interventricular sulcus <coughs> goes to the back and becomes the posterior interventricular sulcus. So to the right of it, this is the right ventricle. To the left of it, this is the left ventricle. Now if we look at the borders of the heart, notice the right border of the heart is formed by the right atrium, because this chamber above is the right atrium. This inferior border of the heart, the I stands for inferior, the inferior border of the heart is formed by the right ventricle as well as the left ventricle. Can you see that? This part here is called the apex of the heart. So which chamber forms the apex of the heart? Which chamber forms the apex of the heart? Left ventricle. Left ventricle. You can see that, just the left ventricle. This part here is the left border of the heart, notice this, formed by the left ventricle. And this small part of the left atrium, which is called left auricle. What does the word auricle mean to you? Ear. ear. Remember when you did the ANP one, external ear was called the auricle. Auricle means any ear-shaped process. So this part of the right atrium is also called the auricle, the right auricle. So the left atrium, most of the left atrium actually during development rotates to the back and only the auricle is present on the anterior surface. So we can see that the left border is formed by the left ventricle and this left auricle. And then the superior border, we, we can't see the superior border because it stretches across like this. So for that, we've got to kind of turn the heart around. And here is where we see the superior border which is formed by, most of it is formed by the left atrium and a small part by the right atrium, okay? Most of it is formed by the left atrium and a small <coughs> part by the right atrium. During fetal development, the heart was lying like this. So this was the right side, this was the left side. So right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. The heart then rotated and came this way, became this way. So what happened is the left atrium, most of it went towards the back, which is why you see most of the left atrium on the posterior aspect. And this posterior aspect is also known as the base. This posterior aspect is also called the base because remember in a triangle, if this is the apex, the part opposite to it is called the base. Right, you remember that from geometry? So this is the apex, so this would be the base. Here is the apex, so the base would be just, you know, on the other side, so that's why the posterior surface is also called the base, okay? This, all of this is the posterior surface, which is also called the base. So now when we look at the chambers, can you see that on the anterior sternocostal surface, you can see the right atrium, you can see a large part of the right ventricle, you can see a small part of the left ventricle and a really tiny part of the left auricle, okay? On the posterior surface, this aspect, on the posterior surface, the base, most of it is formed by the left atrium, a small part by the right atrium. And on this inferior surface, because remember I turned this around, on the inferior surface, you see a large part of the left ventricle and a much smaller right ventricle. And I'll show you more pictures and it'll become a bit clearer. But I hope you've understood the borders and which chambers form that. So here, let's look at the same thing. So here you can see the sulcus really well. So look at the coronary sulcus coming around. 
then on the postero inferior surface and then we see it back here separating the atria above from the ventricles below here is the interventricular sulcus so you can see here the anterior interventricular sulcus will wind around and then we can see the posterior interventricular sulcus in a heart an actual heart whether it's a model or an actual heart the reason we can identify these sulci is because of the presence of these blood vessels otherwise they're just grooves on a heart you can't really make out it's because you can see these blood vessels are lying in these sulci that we are able to actually identify them because the heart is not colored the atria are not colored differently from the ventricles right so here again you can see on the sternocostal look at all the structures that you are seeing up here look at this part this is the base of the heart see most of it is formed by the left atrium just a small part by the right atrium look at this inferior or diaphragmatic surface <laughs> a large part of the left ventricle also the right ventricle but a much smaller part and here on the sternocostal like i said you can see a large part of the right ventricle a much smaller part right atrium and then the left auricle and this part here is the apex of the heart okay okay let's review this which i just told you so we should everybody should get this right so on which surface is most of the left atrium seen Very good, posterior surface, also known as the base, posterior surface, not on the anterior. I said most of it, on the anterior, only the auricle is seen. Okay, let's say you got something like this. Radiologist says that the inferior border, border of the heart has shifted and the chambers <coughs> contributing to this border have enlarged. So which chambers he, is he referring to? So I'm basically asking you which chambers form the inferior border, but just wrote it in a roundabout manner. Okay. So whenever you get questions like this, always look at some key words, some operative words. So here it says inferior border and chambers. So that's what really you're going to concentrate on. Very good, right and left ventricles. So here's a good review for you, a review slide, and you know, make sure you kind of look at this. I'm not gonna go over it. It kind of tells you all the borders and you know, all, mainly all the chambers. So here is the cardiac cycle. This cycle you must understand really well because if you know this cycle, everything kind of becomes very clear. So first of all, there's certain key th uh, factors to understand. Atria, as I said, are superior. Blood always flows one way. Your entire heart is like a plumbing system with valves in between. So to allow blood to flow one way and not kind of go back, if the valves are damaged, that's when blood will back up. And if we kind of draw, if I was to remove the heart and kind of make it into one long tube, and I said this was the atrial end of the tube and this is the ventricular end of the tube. Blood will flow from the atria to the ventricles, there will be a valve between them. From the ventricles then the blood will flow into arteries and again there will be a valve between them. And this is the same for the right and the left side, okay? So that blood flows in a one way fashion. Now let's look at this. Another thing you might want to write here is atria receive blood. And ventricles send blood out of the body. Out of the heart, sorry. Send blood out of the heart. So atria receive blood from the body or another part the lungs so they receive blood then they send it to the ventricles and then the ventricles then send it out of the heart okay so blood enters the heart into atria and leaves the heart via the ventricles so this is one 
quick look at it so veins from all over the body and later you will see even the heart the veins from all over the body bring blood into the right atrium by means of two main veins which are known as vena cava superior vena cava brings blood from the upper part of the body and the upper limb inferior vena cava brings blood from the lower part of the body and the lower limb it gets into the right atrium from the right atrium remember i said there was a valve you want to make sure it just goes one way so from the right atrium, it passes through this valve and goes into the right ventricle. This valve, which is present between the atrium and the ventricle, is also known as atrioventricular valve. Atrioventricular, because between atrium and ventricles, it just so happens that they have this atrio, like how you have the atrioventricular sulcus being called the coronary sulcus. Similarly, the atrioventricular valves on the right and left side also happen to have different names. On the right side, it's called tricuspid. The word cusp means leaflets because these valves have leaflets. So on the right side, it has three. On the left side, it has two. So it's on the left, it's called bicuspid. On the right, it's called tricuspid. So from the right atrium, goes into the right ventricle through this tricuspid or right atrioventricular valve. From the right ventricle, passes into an artery called the pulmonary trunk, and it'll pass through a valve here, which is called the pulmonary valve. These valves, the pulmonary and the aortic, have another name. They are also known as semilunar valves, so you may want to write it here. These are called semilunar because when we look at their valve leaflets, they look like half moons. The word pulmonary has to do with lungs. So engrave this in your head. Pulmonary means lungs. So from the right ventricle, by means of the pulmonary, through the pulmonary valve, it goes into the pulmonary artery, which divides into a right and a left pulmonary artery. So it goes to the lungs, where it gets oxygenated, because veins carry deoxygenated blood, or blood which has less oxygen, more carbon dioxide. So it goes into the lungs where it gets oxygenated from the lungs pulmonary veins bring blood back into the left atrium remember atria received blood and veins were bringing the blood so pulmonary veins from the lungs bring blood into the left atrium and there's a bit of a difference here then from the left atrium just like the right side from the left atrium blood goes into the left ventricle <laughs> through means of this left atrioventricular also called mitral or also called bicuspid valve so many names are also called left atrioventricular and then from the left ventricles by through the aorta it goes it goes into the aorta through the aortic valve and goes to the body circulates in the body and then veins will bring it all black back Normally, we always color veins blue because they carry deoxygenated blood, and we color arteries red because they carry oxygenated blood, okay? But look at the difference up here. Can you see that the pulmonary artery is carrying blue blood? Because it's getting the blood from here. So pulmonary artery is one exception to the rule where it's an artery, but it's carrying deoxygenated blood. And look at this, the pulmonary veins. Here, the pulmonary vein. It's bringing blood from the lungs to the atrium, and we show it in red. So this is the other exception, where it's a vein, but it's carrying oxygenated blood instead of deoxygenated, okay? So you, you must know this. So let's take a look at this cardiac cycle. The heart is a pump which must circulate blood through two di different but interconnected vascular systems. The smaller of these systems is the pulmonary system. Okay, I don't know Blood returning from the upper part of the body is delivered to the right atrium of the heart by the superior vena cava. Okay, uh, 
looks like this didn't work. So um, I want you to kind of take this. There's a, a video of this in your notes. So take a look. I don't know why it's not working. So I don't want to waste time on this. But um, even if you look at this picture up here, you can see that how it kind of circulates. OK? So having paid attention to this picture, let's answer this question. What is the difference in blood entering the atria? Okay, most of you got this right. Deoxygenated <laughs> venous blood enters the right atrium and oxygenated venous blood enters the left. Oxygenated venous blood does not enter both atria because remember, normally veins carry deoxygenated blood. Neither does deoxygenated enter both atria because the pulmonary veins were an exception to the rule. And this is kind of switched around, so this is not it. So it is the deoxygenate. And that's why looking at these images becomes really important, because you can see the color difference between the right and the left side. <coughs> so here are some common features of atria. One, as I said, they are superior to the ventricles. They have ear-shaped processes, which we call the auricle. Then you will notice that in the atria, and when you go to the lab too, you will see that atria have a smooth part, you know, where the the wall of the atrium is smooth, and they have a rough part. And the rough part of the atria is called musculi pectinati, or also known as pectinate muscles. Because when you look at these muscles, they look like the teeth of a comb. Pectinate is like the teeth of a comb or serrated. Um, in the left auricle, most of the uh, auricle is the part which contains the musculi pectinati. The rest of the atrium is pretty smooth. Because there are two atria, they have to, you have to have a wall between them. So between the two atria, you have an interatrial septum which is present, which develops during fetal life. In fetal life, the, the septum has a hole between them. So if this is one atrium and this is the other atrium, there's actually a gap between them. So imagine like this. So this is the right atrium, this is the left atrium. There's an opening between the two in the interatrial septum. That opening is known as foramen ovale. Once the child is born, that septum closes. So in the wall, you will see a depression, which is called fossa ovalis. So the fossa ovalis is a remnant of that opening called foramen ovale. Whenever you're doing any chamber, you must always know special features, and you must know what openings are seen in that chamber. Because atria receive veins, you will see venous openings in each chamber. There may be one vein opening, there may be four, there may be separate openings, you must know that. And plus, because the atria send blood into the ventricles, you have the atrioventricular openings with valves, and the left atrial wall is actually thicker than the right atrium. So let's take a look at that. So here, when we are looking at the two chambers, so here we can see the right atrium. So you're, we've opened up the wall of the right atrium, this is the rough part, which is called this musculi pectinati. So look how kind of rough it's looking. This, all of this is the smooth part. This is the interatrial septum, because this is the right atrium, and on the other side is the left atrium. Here is that depression in the interatrial chamber, which is called fossa ovalis, which is a remnant of that foramen ovale. You can uh, ignore this crista terminalis, but in case you wanted to know what it is, it's just a sort of a ridge which separates the rough from the smooth part. The openings that we see in this right atrium, blood from the upper body being brought by the superior vena cava, so superior vena cava opening, blood from the lower part of the body being brought by the inferior vena cava, so inferior vena cava opening, then blood from the heart itself, the myocardium of the heart, which brings blood to it by means of something known as the coronary sinus, so this is the opening of that coronary sinus. What you can't see 
here, but actually you, you can see a little bit. These veins which are present here, these veins are called anterior cardiac veins. They open separately into the right atrium, so they, are, they drain some of the myocardium of the heart and open separately into the right atrium. And later when we do the coronary circulation, we will see that every chamber of the heart has tiny little veins present. So instead of going into one big vein, there are small little veins. Those small veins are called venae cordis minimi. These are present in all chambers of the heart. So if I was to draw it here, imagine as tiny little openings like this called venae cordis minimi. As the name suggests, venae means vein. The word cordis has to do with heart. Minimi means small. So small veins of the heart. So in every chamber, we can't see the openings clearly. You can't see it even in a real heart because they're so small, so small but they are present in every chamber. So these are all the venous openings. Notice this. All of these are the venous openings. And then from the right atrium opening into the right ventricle is this opening, which is the tricuspid opening or also called the right atrioventricular. So these are all the openings that you see in the right atrium. Let's look at the left atrium. Again, the smooth part and this is the rough part which is the musculi pectinati. This is the interatrial septum, this other side, the left side of the interatrial septum. Um, you ignore this because you rarely see it. So you can't see the fossa ovalis on this side. The fossa ovalis is the depression is seen on the right side, right atrium, not on the left side. The openings in the left atrium are four pulmonary veins. So the openings of, because they're two from each lung. So there are two pulmonary on this side and what you can't see, there'll be two more. So pulmonary veins opening into the left atrium. The venae cordis minimi, because I said that opens in every chamber. And this opening, the mitral opening, or also called bicuspid, or the left atrioventricular. And notice the cusps. This, this part is one cusp, and we'll see another one on this side. Here you can't see it. When we look at it from the ventricular side, we'll be able to see these leaflets. But you can see that this is what is a cusp, a leaflet of the valve. So when it comes together like this, it will close. When it is away from each other, then it's open, OK? OK, so how about this question? Sulci or grooves are external and septa are internal. So is this true or false? Yes, very good. You saw the septa were present inside, in between the chambers. So they're internal, whereas sulci, the coronary and interventricular, you saw on the external surface of the heart. So those are external. Now imagine you got a question like this. Which of the following statements is not true about the right atrium? Very good, yes, pulmonary veins do not open into this chamber. Which chamber do they open into? <laughs> left atrium, left atrium. Veins is always atrium, but this is left atrium, okay? Let's look at ventricles, some common features. They are inferior to the atria. They are separated by the interventricular septum. You will see that it's very, very thick, most of it. Uh, uh, the, a small part of it is thin. Where it's thin, it's called the membranous part. The septum bulges into the cavity of the right ventricle. By this, I mean if you take a section of the ventricles, you know, if I cut the lower end of the heart and take a section of the ventricles, and this is the right side and this is the left, the interventricular septum bulges like this. Do you, understand? Do you see that? 
So you can see that the right ventricle is more, like, more or less sickle shaped and the left is circular. Uh, they also have a smooth part and a rough part. In the smooth part has, some na uh, has a special name to it. In the right ventricle, it's called the infundibulum. In the left ventricle, it's called the vestibule. And the rough part also has its own special name. It's called trabaculi carni because these are very, the, uh, the rough part is, it looks extremely fleshy and like a network. So that's why it's called trabaculi carni means fleshy or carnivorous. So that's why we call it trabaculi carni. We will also see that coming from these trabaculi carni, we'll see some projections which are called papillary muscles. There are three on the right side, two on the left. There is this special part which we will see in the right ventricle, which is important for you to remember. It's called the moderator band, and I will show that to you. Now from the ventricle, we will see the ventricular aspect of those atrioventricular openings, which have those same valves. And then we will see another special feature in the ventricles, which are these cord-like structures called cordy tendony. So I will show you all of these. So these are some features which we are going to look at. So let's see the right ventricle. So up here, when you look at the right ventricle, notice this is the smooth part of the right ventricle, which is called the infundibulum. This area is very rough and fleshy looking. So this part is what is called the cordy tendony. So this, uh, sorry, trabaculi carni, not cordy tendony. Trabaculi carni, that's the rough part. Arising from this rough part are these projections. You can see these projections up here. These projections are called papillary muscles. So the little projections, conical projections, which project into the cavity of the ventricle. Also notice coming in, passing right through the cavity of this right ventricle is this little sort of band, which is called the moderator band. And when we do the conducting system of the heart, remind me to, if I forget, to mention why the moderator band is present. There's a reason why you have this. This is the atrioventricular opening or the tricuspid opening because this is the right ventricle. So this here is the tricuspid opening. And here you can see the three cusps or leaflets. One, two, three. And notice attached to these leaflets are these thin cord-like structures. These thin cord-like structures, which look like tendons, are known as cordy tendony. So at one end, can you see that the cusps are attached to cordy tendony? And at the other end, these cordy tendony are attached to the papillary muscles. So can you see that's how the papillary muscles are connected to these cusps by means of these cordy tendony? This part here, this entire part here is the interventricular septum. So on this, this side is the left ventricle. So this is the cavity of the right ventricle. So one opening we have seen, which is the tricuspid opening. So blood enters the ventricle this way. So it will come from the right atrium into the right ventricle through this tricuspid opening. And then it will leave the ventricle through this pulmonary opening here. So it will leave through the pulmonary opening, and this pulmonary opening is guarded by a valve, which at this point is closed. See, notice this is the valve which is closed. So this is the pulmonary valve and passing or which uh, guards the opening, and this goes into the pulmonary artery. So this part here is the pulmonary artery. So that's the second opening. And then, as I said, venae cordis minimi are present in all chambers, so you'll see uh, you don't see them, but they are present. So you'd see these tiny venae cordis minimi. So here I want you to understand what is the purpose of these papillary muscles and why do we have papillary muscles and why do we have cordy tendony and why are they connected to this atrioventricular valves? So when the atria are pushing blood into the ventricles, will this valve be open or closed? open, right? If Only if it's open can blood pass from the atrium into the ventricles. Then when the ventricles contract and push blood into this artery, the pul on, on the right side into the pulmonary artery, on the left into the aorta, if this valve was open, what would happen? Some of the blood will go here, but some of the blood can backtrack, right? 
So remember, valves have to close at some point and open at some point. So when the ventricle contracts, you want this atrioventricular valve to close. So that blood only now goes into this opening. So what happens is when the ventricle contracts, these papillary muscles, which are part of that trabeculae carni, which is the rough part of the myocardium, they will also contract. They will pull on these caudi tendini. When they pull on the caudi tendini, what they do is that if these are the cusps, imagine if this is one cusp, and this is another one, and this is a third one like this, and these are the caudi tendini attached to the papillary muscle. When it pulls on this caudi tendini, the three cusps kind of come close to each other like that. You know, like you pull on it, it'll come close. So with the result, the cusps, all three cusps, get really close to each other and they close off this opening so blood cannot go back into the atria. Do you understand the purpose of the papillary muscle and the caudi tendony, okay? They are only attached, as you can see, to the atrioventricular opening. Notice they are not attached to this pulmonary. So later we'll see how the pulmonary valves will close, okay? Here's the left ventricle. Again, the features, this is the smooth part, which is called the in this case, it's a vestibule. Here is the rough part. You can see it more clearly called trabeculae carni. Notice the papillary muscles. And the openings here are the mitral opening or also called the bicuspid because it has two cusps. As you can see, one cusp and two cusps are also called left atrioventricular. Left atrioventricular. So blood enters the left ventricle through this mitral opening and then blood has to enter the aorta through this aortic opening so this part here is the aortic opening this part here is the aortic opening aortic is very similar to the pulmonary the pulmonary and aortic if you remember i used the word semi lunar earlier i said they were like half moon so can you see these here the leaflets are flat here, can you see the leaflets are like half moons? See, these leaflets are like this, half moons. Can you see that? Okay, that's why they're called semilunar. So the aortic is also a semilunar opening. The left ventricular wall is much thicker because the right ventricle pushes blood through the pulmonary artery to go to the lungs. Lungs are very close by. Left ventricle pushes blood to go to the aorta, which has to go to the whole body. So the wall of the aorta has to be really thick. Uh, sorry, the wall of the ventricle has to be very thick so that it can push it. So the myocardium is three times thicker. So very, very thick wall. And as I told you, the shape was rounded because the interventricular septum up here, like sort of leans or pushes, bulges into the right ventricle. So now when the ventricle contracts, do you think this aortic valve will be open or closed open right because it has to push so when it pushes blood and the blood passes out what do you think will happen to these cusps these cusps will be pushed against the wall of the aorta right or on the right side they would be pushed against the wall of the pulmonary artery okay then once the blood has been pushed out now the ventricle will relax so that the Next, it can kind of start the next cardiac cycle where it has to fill with blood from the atria. So if, when the ventricle relaxes, wouldn't there be a ten tendency for blood which goes into the aorta or the pulmonary trunk for blood to kind of come back into the ventricle? So you don't want that to happen, right? You, don't, you want blood to just remain there, don't want it to come back because it's got to get ready for the next cycle. So here you can understand when the ventricle pushes blood out, it pushes these cusps flush against the wall of the aorta or pulmonary trunk. When the ventricle relaxes, as the blood tries to come back, what it does is it kind of goes into these little spaces which are present here. Can you see these spaces between the cusp and the wall? These spaces are called sinuses. So when these sinuses fill with blood, can you see that now the cusp is kind of projected away from the wall and it kind of becomes like a little cushion which it looks like here. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. So that's how the aortic and pulmonary or semilunar valves close. They close when the ventricles try to relax. The sinuses fill with blood. When they fill with blood, they become like little cushions and hence 
they will close. So now blood cannot re-enter the ventricle. Okay, so this is an open, you can see, and the previous picture here showed you a closed semilunar valve. So can you see how the at atrioventricular and semilunar valves close separately? Another thing I want to point out here is that you all, you all know that the coronary arteries are arteries which supply blood to the heart, the myocardium of the heart. The coronary arteries, we will see, arise from the aorta. Notice here, can you see these two openings are openings of the coronary arteries? Here's another one. <coughs> Notice how they are present very close to these sinuses. So when the ventricle relaxes and these sinuses fill with blood, can you see it is so easy for blood now to enter into the coronary openings and it kind of goes into the coronary arteries. So coronary blood, sub blood flow happens during ventricular relaxation because that's when the sinuses fill with blood. Because during ventricular contraction, this is pushed against it, so those openings are kind of pretty much closed off. When the ventricle relaxes and these sinuses fill with blood, blood can enter those coronary openings and go into the coronary arteries, okay? Okay, now think of this question. So this was everything is going normally, but remember I said it's like a plumbing system. So if one of the valves was uh, narrowed or enlarged, you know, things would go wrong. So here I'm giving you an example. Imagine if the pulmonary valve was narrowed, where would blood back up? Which part would now get have more blood than it should normally have? So that's why knowing the cardiac cycle is very important, and we went over that. So think of the cardiac cycle and answer this question. Right ventricle, yes, very good, right ventricle. Again, really important, so I'm going to, just so that everybody understands. These are the atrioventricular openings, this is the pulmonary opening, going into the pulmonary artery. And here is the aortic opening going into the aorta. So I said this was narrowed. I said this was narrow. So what blood comes from right atrium into right ventricle? From right ventricle tries to go into pulmonary artery, but the valve is narrowed. So it cannot go there. So what happened? Blood tends to back up here first in the right ventricle, right? So what will happen? The right ventricular chamber will enlarge. Then later on, yes, now the blood will backtrack into right atrium and then you'll see that then it'll go into the veins and we get what is called right-sided failure. Okay, do you understand? Suppose left, uh, say mitral valve was narrowed, where would blood back up? Left atrium, yes, very good, because from left atrium it has to go into left ventricle, since this is not functioning properly, goes up there and then it'll go in, back up into lungs, so you'll have what is called left ventricular failure, right? Then in the lungs you'll have be very congested. So really important to understand this plumbing system, okay? Okay, let's see this. I said it was one-way flow. So what is the backflow of blood from the ventricles to the atria? What is that prevented by? Notice how all of these questions are dealing with knowing cardiac cycle. Closure of the atrioventricular. See, you don't want blood to go from the ventricles back into the atria. You want to close the atrioventricular, and that's where those cordy tendini were attached. Semilunar valves, that's why important to always put these other names for them, are aortic and pulmonary. That, if that closes, you just prevent blood from coming back into the ventricles, okay? You need to close the atrioventricular valves off. So this is a, a good uh, picture of the blood supply of the heart. And the blood supply of the heart is by 
arteries called coronary arteries. And later when we do the aorta, we will see the heart is an extremely selfish organ. What was it? Mm -hmm. It's like AB, you know, AB plus group, mm -hmm. very selfish again. And um, this is uh, very similar, you know, like when you go in an aircraft, what happens, um, they say, like, if the pressure drops and, you know, like, breathing becomes a problem and, you know, your oxygen masks come down, what do they tell you? First put it on yourself before you can, before you attend to someone else. Same way, the heart needs to be selfish. It has to first get enough oxygen for itself before it can pump blood to the rest of the body. That's why the first blood vessels which come out from the aorta are towards the heart itself, okay? So here is the aorta, which is coming off the left ventricle. And notice these two big vessels which come off. These are the coronary arteries. There's a right coronary artery and there's a left coronary artery. Look at this picture really carefully. I'm, not going, to, I'm going to show you a more diagrammatic picture, but I'll come back to this picture and kind of see which veins and which arteries lie together and have... Um, kind of try to color code the left side and the right side. But what I want you to notice is that the right coronary artery is an artery which travels around the coronary sulcus. So this is the anterior part. Then we'll see that it'll go to the back like that. And as it keeps going, it keeps giving off branches this way, which these branches are named. An artery will always supply blood to areas close by. So as it's traveling here, you can see it will supply branches to the atrium. It will supply branches to the right ventricle. When it turns around and goes to the back, we will see again it will supply branches to the atrium. And then it will supply branches to both ventricles. The left coronary artery, on the other hand, instead of being one big artery giving off branches, it actually is a very small stem. So it's just this much. This is the left coronary artery. Immediately it divides into two big branches and these branches take over the blood supply one branch which remains in the front up here which is called since it's lying in the anterior interventricular sulcus it's called the anterior interventricular artery or anterior interventricular branch and um, commonly cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons will also call it the anterior descending because it's traveling down or they'll also call it left anterior descending. If you ever look at a cardiologist note, they don't say anterior interventricular. They just say left anterior descending. Okay? These are different names for the same artery. This second branch, which you see here, it kind of hooks around. Can you see how it's kind of turning around? When anything turns around, the word we use in anatomy is the word circumflex. Circumflex is to kind of hook around. So this is called the circumflex branch. So the left coronary has anterior interventricular and circumflex, and these two then give off the various branches. Traveling with these arteries, notice these main veins. So again, I want you all to come back to this picture when we, after we finish doing this part. So let's, so this is on the posterior surface, okay? So notice this right coronary has come towards the back, and then it gives off this posterior interventricular artery, which is lying here. So here now, let's look at the coronary arteries. So this is kind of a diagrammatic view. So this picture can be superimposed on this picture. So if I take this, I can superimpose. So you can see that anything lying here is will travel with this. Anything lying here will travel with this. And what is shown in lighter color is something on the posterior or inferior surface. See, this is showing in lighter color. This is on the postero-inferior surface, okay? So notice this right coronary artery traveling in the coronary sulcus all the way up here, okay? As it travels, it gives off an artery here, which is called the sinoatrial artery. This is seen in about 60% of cases. If the right doesn't give it, the left will give it. Then it gives off, since it's traveling between the atria and the ventricles, it gives off right atrial branches. R RC stands for right coronary. Gives off ventricular branches. Notice this. Before it begins to turn around to go on to the postro inferior side, it gives off a branch which lies along this inferior border. Can you see this branch? 
this branch is called the right marginal artery so this branch is called the right marginal artery and it would be a good idea for you to actually draw this make a rough diagram of the heart and draw it for yourselves and that's how you're going to remember so right marginal artery then this artery turns around and comes on the postero inferior surface where it will supply part of the right atrium a lot of the right ventricle and then gives off a tiny branch which you see here which is called the av nodal artery in about 90% of the cases so in 90% it gives off this av nodal artery and then gives a very large branch which travels in the posterior interventricular sulcus so notice this branch in the posterior interventricular sulcus this branch is called posterior descending or posterior interventricular posterior descending or posterior interventricular <clears throat> posterior interventricular as the name suggests will it supply right and left ventricles or only one ventricle both because it's interventricular it's lying in the interventricular sulcus okay let's look at left coronary short stem as i said gives off this circumflex branch and this anterior descending or anterior interventricular this gives off branches which kind of go diagonally so these are called diagonal branches the left left uh, uh, the circumflex artery as you can see turns around and this circumflex gives a left marginal branch so this is lying on the side so this is called the left marginal branch and then it comes to the back where there is kind of a small anastomosis with the termination of the right coronary now this you can understand is the right left ventricle this part here is the right ventricle in between the two here would be the interventricular septum do you understand right so both these the anterior descending and posterior descending they give branches which you can see here which come perpendicularly down like this or they go perpendicular up to supply the interventricular septum and that's quite important because later we'll see that there's a part of the conducting system in the interventricular septum okay so this if you projected this back on these arteries you can see right coronary notice how it's giving branches look at the left coronary circumflex and the anterior <laughs> descending so see these these are those septal branches and we go to the next picture so here we can see the right coronary and then here is the posterior interventricular here again you can see the septal branches and notice the circumflex and it's giving off branches this up here and here to the left atrium okay so whichever artery lies close to whichever chamber that artery would supply that chamber so you can understand the right coronary artery is very far away from the left atrium so the right coronary artery is unlikely to be supplying any part of the left atrium it is this circumflex branch of the left coronary which will supply the left atrium do you understand similarly the circumflex is so far away from the right atrium so this is not going to supply the right atrium so if you know this picture well you'll be able to say which artery supplies which chambers of the heart followed so we'll stop here and continue with this next time so when you come on thursday we're going to finish up the this part here okay so i'm going to begin so um completed the arteries and the various branches of each of these arteries let's look at the veins now and it's very important for you to know which artery travels with which vein okay uh, as i said last time the area of supply of the artery an artery always supplies an area close to it so if you look at it you can see that the right coronary is unlikely to supply the left atrium so far away so you know make sure you look at these pictures really carefully and look at the this picture up here and i have a question which will come <coughs> up and see if you can answer that question on your own so this picture is superimposed on this so that means these veins which are lying here take the same position the, as the arteries they just they lie side by side with the arteries 
So when the arteries supply the myocardium with oxygen, they break up into capillaries and these will join to form large veins. Most of the blood supply of the heart is drained. When we use the word vein, we use the word drains. That means a vein drains into something. It either drains into a chamber of the heart as here or it drains into a larger vein. So veins, these veins will open into the right atrium of the heart and they open by means of a huge vein which is called the coronary sinus. The word sinus just means a dilated vein. So we'll see some large veins which will open into the coronary sinus and then the coronary sinus in turn will open into the right atrium. So let's take a look at these veins and what they lie with. So the first vein we are going to look at is this sternocostal surface. So here you can see the sternocostal surface. Traveling with this anterior descending artery is this vein called the great cardiac vein. So look at this great cardiac vein. This great cardiac vein then turns around. So it travels part of the way with the anterior descending and then part of the way with the circumflex artery. It turns around and it joins another vein up here. So there is this little vein up here which is called the oblique vein. This is called the oblique vein of the left atrium. The two join together and form this big dilated vein which is called the coronary sinus. So this great cardiac vein travels from the sternocostal surface, turns around and then you can see joining with the oblique vein, it opens into the coronary sinus. It actually forms the coronary sinus. On the diaphragmatic surface up here, traveling with this posterior descending artery is a vein which actually begins on the anterior surface. Then you can see it hooks around and goes on to the posterior surface. This is called the middle cardiac vein. So the middle cardiac vein mainly travels with the posterior descending. This small portion up here you can see would travel with the anterior descending. But most of it is traveling with the posterior descending. So they lie in the posterior interventricular sulcus. And this middle cardiac vein drains again you can see into the coronary sinus. Then along the inferior margin traveling with this right marginal artery. This was the right marginal artery. <coughs> Traveling with it, this is the small cardiac vein. This small cardiac vein turns around and goes on again to the posterior, postero inferior surface, where again it also opens into the coronary sinus. So this here is the coronary sinus. So you can see all these three big major veins are opening into the coronary sinus. This coronary sinus in turn opens into the right atrium of the heart. Do you remember the right atrium of the heart? One of the openings was the opening of the coronary sinus. So it itself, then it pours all of this blood into the right atrium of the heart. Then here you can see these two veins. These are called the anterior cardiac veins. And this is the right atrium of the heart. So notice how the anterior cardiac veins are opening into the right atrium of the heart. What is not shown here is the small, what we call the vena cordis minimi. Remember, if every chamber of the heart had these small veins which opened into them. So you have these tiny little veins which will open into each chamber of the heart, many of them. So those are not shown up here and those were called vena cordis minimi, small veins of the heart. So this is a good review slide for you, telling you the right coronary and its branches, the left coronary, its two main branches, and the branch of anterior interventricular are these, the branches of circumflex are these. These are the coronary sinus, this is the coronary sinus. Tributaries means <laughs> for an artery, we use the word branches. For a vein, because small veins drain into larger veins, instead of saying what are the branches of the coronary sinus, they don't branch out, they receive. We use the word tributaries. So you can see these are the tributaries of the coronary sinus and these are the other <coughs> separate veins. You had a question? The 60 percent is that the sinoatrial nodal artery comes off 60 percent of the times from the right coronary. 
and uh, the AV nodal artery, 90% of the times it comes off from the right coronary artery. If it doesn't come off from the right coronary, in 10% of people we see it coming off from the left and in 40% from the left coronary, okay? Um, whenever we give you uh, any of these branches of, um, of an artery or tributaries of a vein, this is what is commonly seen, but there are always variations, so it's not necessarily typical. So this is what is seen. So let's answer this question. Which of the following veins does not join the coronary sinus or does not drain into the coronary sinus? Very good, anterior cardiac veins. This is why not only is it very important to read your notes very carefully, but I kind of reiterate them by means of pictures and by means of text. So look up here, if you just look at this picture, notice how you can see the great cardiac vein, this oblique vein which I labeled for you now, the middle cardiac and the small cardiac, all draining into coronary sinus. Look at the anterior cardiac veins. They are not opening here, they're opening separately up here. And then on this next slide, notice how it says coronary sinus tributaries. Only these four are named under it. Anterior cardiac is by itself, just as vena cordis minimi is by itself. So always kind of pay attention to little things like this, okay? Now let's move on to the conduction system of the heart. The heart has its own autorhythmicity. It can contract on its own. And that's because of the specialized muscle fibers which are present inside the heart, which are capable of <coughs> conducting impulses. But the heart is also influenced by the autonomic nervous system. So in the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic system will increase the heart rate and it will increase the force of contraction of the heart muscle. <coughs> the parasympathetic system only acts on the heart rate. It decreases the heart rate. It will do the opposite. So sympathetic system increases heart rate and increases force of contraction. Parasympathetic system decreases the heart rate. So let's look at this specialized conduction system of the heart. In, in the right atrium, in two areas, the, this specialized conduction system is kind of concentrated as a little bump or a node. The first one, which is present just below the opening of the superior vena cava, is called the sinoatrial node. Sinoatrial node. It's present in the right atrium. This is the one which sets the rhythm of the heart, the heart rate. So that's why this is called the pacemaker of the heart. Okay, it's called the pacemaker. It sets your pace. Then we'll see how this sinoatrial node will actually send its through again branches. It will send impulses to both atria so that it <coughs> stimulates the atria and makes them contract. And then you want the impulse to come down to the ventricle so that you give the ventricles the trigger to contract, right? So from the sinoatrial node, you'll see one kind of specialized bundle of fibers coming to another node, which is also present in the right atrium, which is called the atrioventricular node. So you can see by the name itself, this will conduct impulses from the atrium to the ventricle. So this is called atrioventricular node, and this sends impulses to the ventricles. And then since you have two ventricles, from the atrioventricular node, you begin with one bundle, it's named after the person who first discovered it, who is called His. So bundle of His. And that bundle will divide into two branches, a right bundle and a left bundle, which will go to the right and left ventricles. And when they go to the ventricles, they spread out in the ventricles as specialized fibers just under the endocardium. And those are known as Purkinje fibers. 
and these will actually stimulate the ventricles and as also the atria and that's how the heart contracts. So let's take a look at these. So here this is the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. This is the interventricular septum and this is the interatrial septum. So here is the sinoatrial node which sends, which starts the pace of the heart, sends impulses to the right atrium, then goes across to the left atrium as well so that both atria are stimulated and then they will contract. And most of, the contra most of the blood from the atria enters the ventricles by gravity. Towards the end, the atria contract, and that's why you need this stimulation from the sinoatrial node so that the remaining blood in the atria can be pushed down into the ventricles. Then from here, branches come down, the specialized muscle fibers come down to this atrioventricular node. This atrioventricular node in this picture doesn't look like it, but it lies very close to the interatrial septum. So if the interatrial septum, you've heard of children who are born with a hole in the heart, right? Usually that hole in the heart means there's a problem in the septum. It could be interatrial or interventricular. It's not like the top of the heart has been punched off and there's a big hole there. The hole is be always because of developmental problems. Because these septa, the atrio, interatrial and interventricular septa are developed, you know, between two chambers. When a, so when a wall is developing between two chambers, there's always a possibility that the two ends may not meet and that's where you get a, an opening. So if there's an opening in the interatrial septum, uh, which is called patent foramen ovale, Remember we did in the, in the interatrial septum, there was a depression called fossa ovalis, which I told you was part of that foramen ovale. So this is called patent foramen ovale. The word patent means open. So an open foramen ovale, if there is a problem here like this, if this area is open, it may involve the atrioventricular node. So you could have then conduction problems because the atrioventricular node does lie very close to the interatrial septum. From the AV node, again, specialized fibers collect together as a bundle, which is called the bundle of His. Notice how the bundle of His travels in the interventricular septum. And then while it's in the interventricular septum, it will divide into two branches, the right bundle and the left bundle to go to the right and left ventricles. And then it goes just under the endocardium and spreads out as Purkinje fibers. These are all Purkinje fibers, which is called the subendocardial network. So this is the intrinsic conducting system. If you remember, I told you that in the right ventricle and only in the right ventricle, and you, uh, some of you saw this in the lab, there was a, a, bun, a sort of a little muscular band which w went across. Does anybody remember what that band was called? Very good, moderator band. And I said, I will tell you why there is this reason why the moderator band is present only in the right ventricle. So if you look up here, remember when the ventricle contracts, and we determined that, right? When the ventricle contracts, we want the AV valves to close, isn't it? We wanted the atrioventricular valves to close because when the ventricle contracts, it will pu push blood from the right side into the pulmonary artery, from the left side into the aorta. <coughs> If it was contracting and these AV valves are open, what would happen? Blood would go back into the atria. And that's why those papillary muscles contracted and pulled on the caudi tendony and they closed off these AV valves. So when the ventricle is going to contract, you first want to close off the AV valves before actual real forceful ventricular contraction occurs. So the first stimulus you want is to go to the papillary muscles, which are connected to the AV valves. Look on the left side, here's this papillary muscle and the, so this branch kind of peels off and goes straight to this papillary muscle which contracts. So it immediately kind of pulls on the mitral valve and closes it off. On the right side, the papillary muscle is a little far away actually. So this here, you need the moderator band so that you can get some of these fibers passing through the moderator band and through the moderator band, it will go to the papillary muscle so that the right atrioventricular or tricuspid valve will also close before proper strong ventricular contraction begins. Do you understand? So that's the reason why you have the moderator band. And, and this is showing you how the, 
vagus nerve, which is part of the parasympathetic, decreases the heart rate. Sympathetic increases the heart rate and increases force of contraction. So again, please be sure to look at your PowerPoint slides very, very carefully. Always look at every label. The more you look at these labels, the more things will stick in your head because all the information is really given up here. And that'll help you with quizzes and the test, okay? So don't just kind of look at it in a very cursory fashion. So again, with, if you had ventricular septal defects, you can understand that again, there would be conduction problems because you can see how the bundle of his as well as the right and left bundle branches are traveling in the interventricular septum. Okay. I already told you this, so we'll skip this, right? So it would affect it. Now we're going to go on to circulation. So let's do a little bit of blood vessel histology. <coughs> blood vessels consist of three layers. <coughs> layers in anatomy are also known as strata. They are also called just plain layers or also known as tunics. The word intima is intimate, meaning very close to. So that means this tunica intima is very close to the blood, the closest to the blood. So when you take the, a blood vessel, so if you take a blood vessel like this, and if this is the wall of the blood vessel, this layer will be tunica intima because this is, close, this is blood pleasant, present here. So this will be tunica intima. The middle layer, is called tunica media, and that's the one which has the smooth muscle present in it. So that's tunica media up here. And then the outermost layer is connective tissue. Connective tissues often have the word adventitia, or this could also be known as tunica externa, just to tell you that this is on the external aspect. The tunica intima, the lining, is called endothelium. And just under the endothelium with the basement membrane, you have connective tissue. The middle layer is tunica media, which, has a, which is thick, made up of smooth muscle. In elastic arteries, like the aorta and the three main branches which come out from it, you have a little bit of elastic tissue interspersed with the muscle because when blood flows into the aorta, you want the aorta to expand so that it can accommodate the blood. And then the aorta has to recoil so that blood is pushed forward. That's why blood in the arteries is pulsatile. You know, you can feel the pulse because there's expansion and contraction. Expansion when it receives, when it recoils, it pushes the blood to the next segment. And the last layer is called tunica externa or adventitia, which has just connective tissue. Since arteries have to push blood to a greater area under great pressure, the tunica media is extremely thick. <coughs> Veins, on the other hand, have blood flowing through them at a lower pace, not under so much pressure. Blood actually flows very, very slowly through veins. So ve venous walls tend to collapse. So to prevent them from collapsing, their tunica adventitia is much thicker. The media is not as thick because they don't need to re expand and recoil. The adventitia is extremely thick. So that's the difference between arteries and veins. Apart from the fact that arteries are usually more circular, the lumen is more circular, ve veins tend to have a more irregular lumen. And capillaries, where gas exchange takes place. Wherever there is gas exchange, you never want a very, very thick wall. So if you look at an artery, this is what an artery would look like. This is the wall of the artery. If you look at a capillary, this is what a capillary will be like. Extremely thin, that's it, that's the wall. It just has tunica intima, so that gases can pass in and out of it. Oxygen from the cap uh, arterial end of the capillary goes to tissues. Carbon dioxide from the tissues goes into the venous end of the capillaries, okay? So they only have tunica intima, which means they only have endothelium and a little bit of en subendothelial connective tissue. So here if we look at this, this is showing you a picture of an artery and a vein. This inner layer is the endothelium. You can see the nuclei of the squamous cells. These are the nuclei of the squamous cells. So this is part of tunica intima. 
This is the endothelium of an artery. We're only seeing part of it. So this is the endothelium and the nuclei. This is the muscle layer, which is tunica media. So notice how thick it is. This layer is tunica media, which is the muscle layer. Here in the vein, this layer is tunica media. So notice how much thinner it is. This here is the tunica externa or adventitia in an artery. And look here in a vein, this is the tunica adventitia. So you can see how much thicker it is, okay? <coughs> Let's look at some clinical conditions. Some of these I've kind of mentioned. The first one, atherosclerosis, is a condition where there is plaque deposition, fatty plaque deposition in the walls of the blood vessels. When the cholesterol content in your blood goes up, it tends to get deposited. And what will it do? It will narrow the artery down. And obviously, when an artery gets narrowed, blood supply to the area it's supposed to go to will suffer. These plaques can rupture, or they can get bigger and totally compress the artery. When, if there is a small artery, it can get totally compressed. And then that could lead to total <coughs> lack of blood supply. Whenever there is lack of blood supply, it's known as ischemia. That's when they put, if it's in the coronary arteries, they put a stent inside. What they do is they, uh, first they have to inflate, so open up the artery, and then if you remove that catheter through which you open it up, it will close back again. So they put a little wire mesh to keep it open, like a little <coughs> stent. So it, it could lead to ischemia. I have a little in your notes something on ischemic heart disease. Make sure you kind of take a look at that. So, you know, that's why they say do not have too much cholesterol, not too much fat in your diet because that's what it could get deposited as. You have another condition which is not written here, but this is called arteriosclerosis, which is a little different. Arteriosclerosis occurs as we age, our arteries get less elastic. You get calcium deposits in the arteries. So it becomes like really like hard pipes. So then when they become like that, again, it could become a problem because they can't expand and recoil. And you know, again, blood supply gets compromised. So arteriosclerosis is something that usually occurs with age. Atherosclerosis can occur at any time. Infarction is cell death. And since we're doing the cardiovascular system, we'll call it myocardial infarction. You've heard of people, you've heard of the term angina, right? And then you may have heard of someone having myocardial infarction. Angina is a condition which is because of temporary ischemia to the cardiac muscle. So the muscle doesn't die totally. There's just temporary ischemia. The cor coronary arteries go into a spasm. Or if they are blocked, like 70%, and let's say the person does you know, normal <coughs> sitting sedentary exercises, the, the blockage is OK to you know, provide the heart muscle with oxygen. But the person suddenly starts doing some strenuous activity where they need the cardiac muscle needs more oxygen. That heart, now the arteries cannot supply them because they are blocked then the person begins to feel pain. Because in, uh, in organs, pain is felt when the organ either is stretched or the organ lacks blood supply. That's how pain is felt. If you pinch an organ, it will, you will not feel pain. If you pinch your skin, you will feel pain, okay? So organ pain or visceral pain is because of lack of blood supply or because of stretch. So in, in angina, it is temporary ischemia. But that's a warning sign. So that's why when the person complains of chest pain and you know pain radiates down the arm because of similar segments uh, of the spinal cord which go to that area. So then you, uh, the person goes and visits the doctor and they do tests and then they find out that there is so much blockage and that's when they can take care of it. But sometimes you might have a situation where a <coughs> clot may completely block an artery uh, and if it's a major artery, like the left anterior descending, which supplies a lot of the two ventricles, 
then there is no time. The ventricles have total ischemia. The heart muscle dies. So then the person suffers from a myocardial infarction. That, when that muscle dies, you cannot do anything to it. It's dead. It cannot regenerate. So the heart has to do without that. You can understand if a major part of the cardiac muscle is affected, the heart cannot perform its function, and that's why it proves fatal. So very big myocardial infarctions <coughs> tend to be fatal. If it's a small infarction, patient may feel pain, heart functioning may be compromised, but they need not necessarily be fatal, OK? Um, yeah. What was angina? Angina was temporary ischemia because of, usually because of coronary vessel spasm. Septal <laughs> defects, like I said, you could have an atrial septal defect, you could have a ventricular septal defect, and usually affect the conducting system. Apart from the fact they could have their own problems. If there's an atrial septal defect, what will happen? Right atrial and left atrial blood would mix. If there's a ventricular septal defect, again, right, atri uh, right ventricular, left ventricular blood would mix, and it would come with its own host of problems. Itis means inflammation. Pericarditis means inflammation of the pericardium. So this could be viral. This could be usually tends to be viral. It could be part of anything, general septicemia. When the pericardium becomes inflamed, it tends to produce fluid. Any tissue which gets inflamed, if it's capable of producing fluid, it will secrete more fluid. So the pericardial cavity becomes filled with fluid if it gets really too much, then it can compromise the working of the heart, right? Remember I told you, if there was blood in the pericardial cavity, if someone got stabbed and blood went into the pericardial cavity, I showed you how heart uh, muscle or the heart functioning would be compromised. Same way, if pericardial fluid begins to keep increasing in amount more than it normally should be, what will happen? The heart will not be able to expand, so then it won't fill properly, so its functioning would be compromised. Enlarged heart is due to different reasons. Uh, it is when we do cardiovascular physiology, we'll we'll see that. And enlarged heart could be because mm -hmm. of it doesn't necessarily be is not due to pericarditis, but somebody could have, for example, uh, the mitral valve is not functioning, or the aortic valve, or let me give you an example, the pulmonary valve is not functioning. So the right ventricle is not able to push blood into the pulmonary valve. Okay, suppose it's narrowed. So what happens, it's kind of, when anything is narrow, what do you do? And you have to push something through. You squeeze harder. So the heart muscle kind of works really hard to push the blood out. When it keeps working so hard, it begins to hypertrophy. That means increase in size. So then the heart muscle gets bigger and bigger. When muscle gets bigger, it needs more oxygen. When it needs more oxygen, if it cannot be provided with that oxygen, it begins to fail. So that, that would be a condition of hyper cardiac hypertrophy. Yes, if the, the, anything when it hypertrophies, when it shouldn't hypertrophy, obviously it's going to demand more oxygen. And you, you cannot provide oxygen to that. Yes, it would manifest as having shortness of breath because, you know, one, it itself is not getting enough uh, blood supply. Second, it's not able to send enough blood to the lungs. Suppose it was the right side of the heart. And then so there was oxygenation in the lungs is not occurring the way it should. So that also could affect it. Okay, so that's cardiovascular um, anatomy. Okay, sorry. Uh, oh, okay, so let's go back to congenital heart disease. <clears throat> so congenital heart disease are various types. Septal defects are one type of congenital heart disease. Um, there are various situations, um, I don't know if you've heard, where people are born with uh, what is called dextrocardia. The heart, instead of being on the left side, is actually on the right side of the body. Uh, also, there could be con uh, congenital conditions because when the heart develops, it develops as a single tube, the tube coils, and then it becomes um, you know, divided into four chambers. Uh, another thing could be what is called transposition of the great vessels. You don't have to write this. I'm just telling you out of interest. So instead of the aorta coming from the left ventricle and the pulmonary artery coming from the right ventricle, they're switched. So the aorta comes from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery comes from the left ventricle. So you can understand this would not be compatible with life, right? Because they're going to the opposite places. 
So, uh, you know, little things like this. So there are many conditions like this. There are conditions where uh, there's a septal defect, one valve is narrowed, the aorta actually arises from both ventricles, which is, uh, so, and the right ventricle is hypertrophied. This is called phallostetrology. So congenital heart disease means a child is born with it. Congenital means you're born with it. And all of the congenital heart disease is usually developmental because it's during development some problem has occurred. The septa have not formed properly or the chambers have not formed properly or the blood vessels when they were being formed, they actually arise aorta and the pulmonary artery initially arises one stem and then a, a septum grows into them and divides them into two. If that doesn't grow properly, you can, you know, you can see how problems could arise. So that's what is congenital heart disease. Okay?